What I wanted to do is throw ourselves forward a little bit to a couple of other landmark uh, appearances and, and parts of your um, football career. So your first goal, I don't know if you remember this, you probably do, crystal clear. Can you can remind me, remind yep. the, the viewers, the listeners about your first goal in senior football? So I'd now been moved after six or seven games playing uh, right back. Uh, mm -hmm. Then moved to central midfield. The first game I played central midfield was against Man City away. The oh. second one was against Ipswich Town at home, who were then mm -hmm. challenging for the title. Um, uh, yep. And I'll always remember it's the first half. It was on a, on a bobbly pitch near probably, I would say, March time. And yep. the ball came to me and I, I, I saw that Alan Sunderland was going to make a run down the right-hand side. And I, I played mm -hmm. it first time around the corner, and he wasn't going to get to the ball. Uh, right. what it, the ball was I slightly overplayed it. And the goalkeeper and the centre-half got, uh, got in a bit of a muddle. And it yeah. eventually comes to, to Sunderland, gets there, and just cuts it back into the, to the penalty spot. And I'd carried on my run. So now I've got an open goal. The goalkeeper's out of the picture. Yeah. But two players going back on the line. Okay. Uh, it's on a bobbly pitch. And I decided to hit it first time. And I swept it in. And it went right between yeah. the two players. Uh, and it was it, it won the game one nil. Uh, it was a great moment for me. It was a great moment for my parents. I remember they were they were yeah. overjoyed. Um, yeah, and it was a one nil victory against Ipswich, which, which stopped them probably going on and challenging Liverpool for the title that year. Yeah, well, you you're quite good at derailing teams, as we're going to get on to later. Yeah. So um, yeah, I would love to have seen. I've actually looked up the goal, and it, you know this is the great thing about it is you can you can actually find the goal, the actual action. I would love to have said it was a twenty-five yard screamer, but it was a just outside the six-yard box. But you did thread it through. Yeah, two players legs. made their way back to the line. It, it was good enough for me at the time. <laughs> I think you're not going to really complain about your first goal no. and the beauty. No. You're just going to say I got it and I moved yeah. on. Because um, then looking at the way your Arsenal career went. So you, you established yourself on the side and then you became one of the stalwarts, you could say, because you, I think you played 83, 84, you played about 30 games. And in fact, you had had a good run in Team 82, 83, and then you got injured in the last game was actually against Coventry. So again, another one of these coincidences because you ended up going to Coventry. But 83, 84, 30 games, and then 84, 85 was really as you said, the breakthrough year, because you played 40 of the 42 matches because it was a bigger division then. And you were player of the year. So is that something you remember with a lot of pride and it's something yeah. a game where you think, right, next level, we're, we're moving on? See, I, I, I have to, to, to mention this now because this is something that always uh, bugs me a little bit, is that because people look at the stats when you played, how many games you played, People assume you were not in the team. Right. Never once in my whole career was I left out of a team. Okay. So that, that it was only the only reason I was out of sides was because I was injured. Yeah. And that's that. So when I when I declared myself fit to play, I would yeah. always I would always be picked. So so it's quite often when if you look at Wikipedia, couldn't get back into the team or couldn't do this. Well, that wasn't the case. The, yeah. the case was I was injured. I had, a, I had a two at West Ham. I had an eighteen months where I was injured. So you you can't play when you're injured. Uh, so uh, I from the, when I got into the Arsenal team at that particular time that we talked about that first game, I was never out the side unless it was through an injury. Yeah. So I never. So from one season to the next, I could never say, "Oh, that was a good season," or "That was a, a, a you know I was left out the team there." That never happened. It was a case mm -hmm. of when I was fit, I played. But I had more injuries uh, in certain seasons than, than other ones. And the season that I got the actual player of the year, uh, that 85, 86, I think it was, mm -hmm. was building up to the world. That's when I had a lot of injuries during that season in the in the latter half of it, which was, which was a shame. Um, so, yeah, as the seasons went on, I became more important in the sides, in the, in the Arsenal team, I would say, and had a more prominent role. Uh, in the eighty, uh, in the second season, I went from right back at times. I played a lot of games at centre half. We got to two semi cup semi finals. In all those games, I played as the centre half alongside yeah. either David Leary or Chris White. Uh, apart from the semi final, again, 
which I didn't know until um, uh, two hours before the game that I was going to be put back into central midfield to go and uh, play against Brian Robson. Okay. Uh, uh, and I only knew that because Brian Tolbert told me because he'd spoken to, to Stan Flashman, who was uh, who he'd seen on the, on the day before. So Terry Newell told Stan Flashman the team, but not us. Right. Okay. Well, well you know, Stan team. Flashman was a, an important figure in, all, in uh, yeah. football in those days, wasn't he? Yeah, he certainly was. So, uh, yeah, it was it was a it was a great spell at Arsenal, which I, I loved uh, yeah. mentally. Um, uh, we weren't a particularly good team. Uh, there was a we were disjointed. Uh, there was a lot of, I would say, egos. We were all quite egotistical at the time, I think. The, the, the groups didn't always get on with each other. Um, we had, uh, um, yeah, the, there was there was a lot of things. Some of the signings didn't quite work. Lee Chapman never worked uh, when they bought him as a as a 19-year-old from Stoke. Uh, Tommy Cason, unfortunately, didn't work. Uh, he was a very good player at Man City. Uh, so a lot of things didn't quite, we, we promised a lot. But you could always tell we were never quite going to be right up at the top and win things because there was always an element of we'd shoot ourselves in the foot somewhere along the line. Mm, yeah, it's. I suppose they've thrown. You know, they also went through an incredibly successful period after this, and uh, and you mentioned the fact that you and George Graham didn't exactly see eye to eye, and when he arrived, that was the end of your Arsenal mm. career, and you went then to West Ham, but. You know, that idea where a team just has, just doesn't get over the line. Um, mm. And I mean, you could say of the current Arsenal side, obviously they've been very close in the last two seasons yeah. to get in the Premier League, but they're up against the juggernaut. That is Man City. And that is a tough thing to break down. If you show any sign of weakness, they're there and they're not going to let you back in. But Arsenal have, let's say, they did have a golden period where they won the old first division and then they won the Premier League several times under Wenger. Mm. So did you ever feel like that was just a moment in time where you thought, I just wish I'd been five years later or five years earlier that time? I've never, ever thought that. No, I've never, I, okay. I sort of think, I wish that would have been the case. I played at a time uh, where uh, I really enjoyed the football. It was quite raw. Football was raw in the early 80s. Uh, mm. I loved the atmosphere of the games. I enjoyed playing for Terry Neal. I enjoyed playing for Don Howe. And that's what I would say about my career. When people say, well, who do you, who, who's your team? I say, well, I haven't got a team. They say, well, surely it must be Arsenal. It must be West Ham. It must be Coventry. You know. yeah. I say, no. I, looking back at it, I played for the coaches. I enjoyed playing while I got, had a good relationship with the coaches. I didn't enjoy playing when I didn't have a good relationship with the coach. So it doesn't matter what what club you play for, you have to have a good relationship with the coach uh, and the yeah. people you're playing with. Uh, and that was the case for a, a long time at Arsenal. Um, mm. uh, and it's been the case throughout my career that quite often when managers change, well, it doesn't matter if it's, if it's even if it's in the um, media industry, that's changed mm. my thought on the, on the way the, the company is. Uh, yeah. And that was the case with West Ham, uh, with, with Arsenal, shall I say. Terry Neal, it continued with Don Howe who I'd yeah. got on very well with, uh, who I'd later worked with at Coventry. Uh, yeah. And it didn't work at, with um, George Graham, mainly because when he first took over, I was injured. I got picked for the England squad. I went with England to the game I was talking about, Sweden. And when I came back, I said, I can't play at the moment. I said, oh, my injury hasn't improved. I can't play at my best. This was after four games, I think, three games of the season. And he, mm -hmm. said, he said that I put England before Arsenal which I think said, well, if you'd have been here before, I'd put uh, Arsenal before England yeah. on about six occasions when I wasn't quite fit to play. You know, I, I had a slight injury and I said, no, I won't play for England. I'll make sure I'm fit for Arsenal the next week. So that yeah. caused the rift. I was then proved right because I had to go and have a, a quite a major operation. And it was mm -hmm. while I was having the major operation, it came out in the papers that um, uh, Everton had made an offer and so, had Ar and so had West Ham for me while I was in the... The operating theatre. So, yeah, that yeah. that that was the, that was the angst at the time. Wheels upon wheels, you know. There's <laughs> lots going on that you don't have control yeah. of your destiny, which is true in many walks of life. But a couple of firsts that I like to look at, as well as just your first debut, uh, your debut match. I'd like uh, you to, do, and again, we talked about this uh, when we met briefly at Wembley. Your first 
red card, and only, if I could point out everybody, your first and only red card. Can you just talk to us a little bit about how that came about? Well, I'll tell you that in a minute, but let me tell you, yeah. if I was playing now, I'd have a lot of red cards, I think. I think the, <laughs> the, game's changed, the way the game is played yes. now, you used to be able to get away with a lot more. And it, not, because you, not because you were dirty, but because you went into challenges, think, well, if I get the ball, I get the man, it, you know, it's, it's not, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it, I'm going to put in a strong challenge and I hopefully get the ball. But now you'd be, you'd be sent off for that. But this, this game was against Spurs. Mm -hmm. I was still only 17, uh, I think. Um, I might have just gone, no, I might have turned 18 at this point and we're playing yeah. Tottenham Hotspur on Boxing Day, uh, 1982. Yeah. Yes, um, that's right. And it was at Highbury. There was a, uh, it's obviously the biggest game of the season for Arsenal yeah. and Tottenham fans. There was 55,000 people there, I think. Mm -hmm. And I was playing centre-half uh, against yeah. their um, front two of Archibald and Crooks, who were there sort of, uh, you know, and yeah. obviously Hoddle was playing and Ardiles and all these players. Mm -hmm. And it was in the, in the second half, I remember the first the first challenge was in the that I got a yellow card for was in the early on in the second half, and I, I don't know how it worked out. The ball was played forward. I won the header against Archibald, and the midfield mm -hmm. seemed to have disappeared because the first person to come racing out of uh, to, towards the ball was Graham Roberts, who was playing centre half for Spurs. Now I'm playing centre, so where the midfield players were, I've got no idea. And we both had about <laughs> 15, 20 yard run at it. Yeah, and I he had a reputation for being a very aggressive player, particularly when he played against Arsenal. Yeah. And uh, I thought he was going to go over the top and or, or yeah. go as far as he could. And so I thought I better match it. Well, he mm. did, unfortunately. Oh. So I I he almost did a, a an ole as I went past him and went past the ball. <laughs> and 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 Steve Perrin was very quick. Whenever I played, we played against Spurs to point out to the referee that I was the player. He had to, the referee had to watch. He, he, he sat right before the game, and he was straight over to the referee. I told you, I told you that, you know. So I got a yellow card, but that wasn't the sending off. The sending off was later on in the game when we were one nil up, and mm -hmm. the right back had gone missing, and I'm playing centre half. As anybody that watched Tottenham in those days will know, that Glenn Hoddle would ping a ball from the right hand side all the way across to the left. Tony Galvin to take into his path and run towards goal. Well, he yeah. played this ball on this occasion, inch perfect, and I was coming across from centre half, and I realised quite early on I haven't quite got the angle of my recovery right, so I'm going to have to dive in and hopefully get the ball. Well, I just missed it and caught Tony yeah. Galvin. So unfortunately, um, it was the second yellow card. But I don't think there's too many players that have got standing ovation. Uh, from about 50,000 people when they got a, a second yellow card to get sent off. No. I got it on that occasion. Oh, well, there you go. That's oh, one uh, to put in the cabinet. There, yeah. There's my standing ovation for getting... Mind you, if you take on Graham Roberts, I think you'd have quite a lot of respect yeah. from the Arsenal. Well, I think it was a time... Actually, Arsenal were thought of at that particular time as being a soft touch. And oh, I, came okay. into the, I came into the side, and that's the fans like me for several reasons, I would say, but one of them was because they always felt as though I was going to give as good as we got um, mm -hmm. and was, was the sort of backbone of the team and had a bit of fight about me. Whereas, although we had some very good players, that was always labelled against us. Even when I was speaking to Stevie Nicol, who I worked with uh, for ESPN, he said, we always used to think Arsenal were a soft touch in those days. And I said, you, right. you're probably right. So, yeah. yeah, that was the sending off. That was the one and only sending off. Well, I think one, you know, you, you made quite a few hundred appearances. To have one sending off for someone yeah. who played, you know, either central midfield or defence, I think that's that's a tick for me. Yeah. Um, but as you say, Graham Rob is not a man to take on. And um, I think I mentioned to you, funnily enough, another podcast guest, Ali Bruce Ball, who you know well, uh, the yeah. Five Live commentator, he had uh, one of his first commentaries was at Yeovil, and uh, Graham Roberts was the manager of Yeovil. Yeah. And he said, even as a manager, he was absolutely terrifying. You know, he wasn't, you know, he didn't have many teeth, did he? I remember him being quite grizzled. And you just think, if, you, if the commentator is intimidated by the manager, that suggests he's quite a terrifying chap. And I think it proved to be uh, not only on the pitch, but, but off the pitch as well. One other 
uh, disciplinary thing I'd like to talk to you about is, again, something that we, we did chat about briefly, is another player who I would call intimidating was David Batty in a slightly different way in that he wasn't physically as strong as Graham Roberts. He was quite a wee fella, but he had a pretty aggressive attitude. And you came across him when you were playing for um, uh, against him in 1992, I think this is right. Um, and tell me a little bit about that, because Leeds had just played Glasgow Rangers in the first leg of a Champions League game. And this game was in between. So tell us what happened in your little uh, contretemps, if we could. Well, before, before, before I tell you about the challenge and what happened in that yes. game, it's some, there's a background to it. Okay. Because the previous season, when Leeds won the title, Mm -hmm. We went to Leeds quite late on in the season on a Sunday game that was televised live, one of the only live televised games at that time. Yeah. And uh, near the end of the game, there was a scramble in our box and Steve Grozovic, a lovely man and a very good goalkeeper mm -hmm. and a good friend of mine, uh, went down to, to get on the, the ball. And David Batty, uh, according to Steve Grozovic, went in, knew exactly what he was doing, went in late and raked his boots down the side of Steve Grozovic's face. Yes. Big yeah. cut, had stitches and whatever. So, you know, he was always adamant that David Batty had done it on purpose. As we're going to the... We're playing them quite early on in the season, the next yeah. year. And as we're going... And, and it's it's uh, when... Um, after the Leeds had played Rangers away from home yeah. and I think had, mm -hmm. had, had lost 2-1 or whatever. That's right, yeah. And uh, on the coach going to the game, Steve Grizovich stands up and says, uh, if anybody does David Batty today, I will buy them drinks for the rest of the year. And everyone else sit down, you know, what you're talking about. Yeah. You know. And when we played the game and uh, mm, I had 25 minutes into the first half, David Batty mm -hmm. was also quite arrogant on the ball where he liked to leave it till the last minute to flick it yeah. off and sort of oh, I was going to invite you to make a challenge. Come on. Yeah. Well, on this occasion, I'm in midfield and I'm coming from the other side and I don't think he'd seen me coming. So I thought, I've got a chance now to, to really get stuck into it and, and win the ball. That's the, that's yeah. my main aim to win the ball. And um, But I, had a, I, I slid in. And just as I slid in, he stepped across the challenge and flicked the ball somewhere else. And I caught him. You know, I, it, it didn't seem as though it was that bad, but he stayed down. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he stayed down and uh, they eventually <laughs> put the stretcher on. And right. he was stretched off much. To, and he was looking at me and shouting a few things out. And uh, one or two of, of the crowd, yeah. well, a lot of the crowd, as you know, from Leeds, were not particularly pleasant. No, but no. I got a call from um, <clears throat> Steve Grizovic, uh, who was in goal 40 yards yeah. away. We, we, he said, can, can, so I ran towards him. He ran towards him. He said, does that mean I owe you beers for the whole of the, uh, <laughs> the rest of the year? I said, well, probably. Uh, he, mind you, he never did buy me a drink for him. Oh, so well, well. David Batty, David Batty didn't play in the second game. Uh, Leeds well, lost at home, lost at home or drew to Rangers at home. Yeah, no, they lost two one as well. So they yeah, they, they went lost, out. To Rangers, he went out of yeah. the Champions League, and everybody suggested that the reason they went out of the Champions League was because I tackled David Batty and and put him out of the game. So right. yeah, I, I was a villain for a little uh, for a couple of years when I went to Leeds. Yeah, I'm sure you you didn't go down that as sort of there the Yorkshire version of the chicken run. No, no, no. Uh, although, no, not quite that bad. Uh, well, mind you, I did have a first there as well at uh, at Town right. Road when uh, um, before before the same game actually, uh, a couple of their supporters said, "Robson, can you can you come and sign an autograph for me?" I said, "Yeah, absolutely, no problem at all." I went over, and as I turned away, one of them said, "And by the way, you're going bald, mate." That, so that was the first time God. somebody had said, so I, I thought, Ooh, maybe I am. So, yeah, <laughs> that, that stuck in my mind. Okay, so we... As you know now, I'm fully bald. Well, you know, you know, time moves on, Stuart. It, it affects us all in, in different ways. Um, and talking about Europe, um, I also wanted to talk to you about your first European match mm -hmm. um, because that was in September 1982, 
and away at Spartak Moscow. Now, so you're now, you're still a teenager, surely, at this point. I'm still 17 at this time. So you're playing away at Spartak Moscow, which must have been, again, is it intimidating or is it just incredible that you're suddenly, you know, in Moscow playing a team that have great tradition in terms yeah, of this, Russian this football? Point, I suppose I, I played 25 games from when I made my debut to the end of the, that yeah. season. I played in every game going into this one at um, yeah. in, in, in Moscow. I, I, I sort of took all these things quite easily. You know, I've, I, 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 it, it, when I look back at it, I think, why was I so calm? How was I so com yeah. composed and so calm? Because uh, it was 80,000 people inside the, 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 the Olympic Stadium. Yeah. What we didn't know at the time was that, um, or we should have known, I don't know how we didn't know, but most of the, the, the Spartak Moscow players had played in the Russian national team uh, in, right. uh, in, yeah. in, in 1982. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, we, were, we, we went there hoping to do quite well, and, and we went 2-0 up. I'd scored the first goal. Yeah. And then cross the ball for Lee Chapman to score the second. Okay, and that's where it sort of ended, being a good uh, positive uh, uh, fixture for <laughs> us because they got back into the game to win three two. Um, that's right. In a very you know fervent atmosphere and uh, inside the Olympic Stadium, mainly yeah. I think uh, half of them were soldiers inside the stadium. They filled the stadium up with soldiers because Spartak Moscow was the was the, yeah, army the military team. team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, and there was one or two things that happened off the field, which I, you might want to know about later. Uh, and and then we lost the home game five two, uh, That's right. which was a, 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 but they went on to be a very good team, and, and we mm. and most of their players were top international players. Uh, and it wasn't really a five two drub, and we were chasing the game when we'd when we'd uh, let a couple yeah. of goals. Um, but yeah, there was one or two incidences. So I was meant to be rooming when we went to to Moscow. I remember this was when it was very much the behind the Iron Curtain and, and uh, yeah. yeah, a, a, a difficult place to go to. And I was meant to be rooming with George Wood. Oh, yes. um, but for some reason, uh, George and I changed over. So I roomed with Brian McDermott and George Wood roomed with Lee Chapman. We were getting on the bus the next day after the game to get to the airport and the police turned up with guns and things and uh, they asked for Wood and Robson to get off the off the uh, bus, which right. the manager obviously joined us. Terry Neal was with us, yeah. trying to explain, and the, and the secretary, Ken Fry, was there. Um, yeah. uh, you have smashed up, in the, in, through the internet, you've smashed up the hotel room, um, so we're arresting you. Um, okay. Well, I wasn't rooming with George Wood. I was rooming with uh, Brian McDermott, but the, on the sheet, I was rooming with George Wood. And uh, Lee Chapman, to his credit, came down the bus and said, "No, it was it was me. I was with George Wood, so I was able to go back on the bus." Uh, and they were eventually let off, but they'd obviously had a, a, a mad half hour. And George, uh, who was a lovely chap, but once he had a mm. drink, very much like a, a lot of Scotsmen when they've had a drink, got slightly um, yes. Excited. And uh, I think he'd done one or two things to the hotel room, which uh, wasn't uh, appreciated by the. Uh, management so uh yes yeah we eventually got away with it but uh for a moment there i was having a mad, mad panic yeah to, to be you know a teenager thrown inside a russian jail wouldn't have been much fun I don't no. think. That, that would have really made you grow up pretty quickly <laughs> yes george wood who i know because he also came to palace he did uh, after us. his career yeah um and talking of Scotland, we do have to talk about this because today is the 14th of june and scotland will be kicking off their campaign against Germany later on. Quick prediction, Stuart. Germany I to won't win. hold you to this. I won't hold you to Germany this. to win by three goals to one. I think Germany are on the uh, uh, on a, a comeback. Uh, Nagelsmann, yeah. I think, is the coach. They've got Tony Crowe's yeah. back in their squad and will probably play. I still don't think they've got a great centre forward, but overall, yeah. Germany should be good enough to beat Scotland. However, however well Scotland have done to get to the tournament, I still don't think they're a great team. No, I, I agree with you. I'm married to a Scot. Three of my nephews are out in Germany at the moment. None of Will them they come back? Years. Well, I don't know. I mean, they, didn't come back I mean, they, they look like they're having a good time. But, yeah. the, but the, the scenes that I see on you know Twitter and everything, Scots are great, you know, as fans. There are 200,000 out there. 
Yeah. And only 10,000 are going to have tickets to the game. So it's going to be quite lively, I believe. I would, around. I would suggest so. Yeah. Um, but we're not here just to talk about Scottish um, uh, celebrations before they even play. So a couple of, couple of last things I'd like to go through with you, uh, if possible. So West Ham, you moved there. John Lyle, um, mm -hmm. you made your debut. Again, I will point this out. Because I keep when I do the research, I go, hang on a minute, this is a bit yeah. funky. You made your debut at Highfield Road. Yes. And the coincidence, of course, you made your Arsenal debut at West Ham. Yeah. You made your West Ham debut at Coventry, who you then went on to play for. Do you remember that game? The the your West Ham debut at Highfield? I remember it only too well because it I was signed by West Ham while I was injured. So it was a yes. it was so I'd been, I hadn't played since the fourth game of the season. I'd had this, mm -hmm. this big operation. Uh, I was then signed by West Ham, having not played any reserve games or anything. Um, mm -hmm. It was a big risk. Uh, and I didn't play. They had a couple of games which I didn't play because I, 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 I said I played for the reserves. So I played for West Ham reserves for, for actually only one game. We played QPR. And then... There was a cup game against, I think they played Orient in the cup, West Ham. And then I was going to play against Coventry away from home. Yeah, And it couldn't have gone any better, really, uh, apart from getting a yellow card within five or ten minutes uh, for a tackle on uh, Mickey Gin, I think it was. Um, and uh, I hit the post early on uh, and I created a goal for one of the goals for Tony Cotty. And I think we won the game 3-1, if I'm not mistaken. And Tony Cotty scored yeah. a hat-trick. You're absolutely uh, right. yeah. And it was a really good performance and we, we played well on the day. Uh, and yeah, it couldn't have gone any better um, yeah. for me. The, yeah. the only problem was having not played for, for so long, I was absolutely shattered. And then we had another game on the Tuesday night, which was against Spurs in the League Cup quarterfinal, right. um, which um, yeah, didn't go quite so well for, for us and, and, and as a team. So, yeah. yeah. It was, but it was a, it, I really enjoyed the debut. It was a, it was a great place to play. There was a Big travelling uh, West Ham contingent, uh, played on a nice slick pitch. Uh, everything went our way. Cotty scored a hat-trick. Um, we, we completely dominated Coventry, who were a decent side at the time. So, yeah, it was a pleasing debut there. And, again, you mentioned injuries because you say you did have quite a few injuries that unfortunately took you out. Um, and, in fact, in October... 1988 in a 4-1 loss and this is ridiculous to Arsenal at Upton Park you got injured and I think that was almost your last game because hmm. you then were out for a bit and then you moved to Coventry uh, was it Terry Butcher was the manager at Coventry at the Terry time? Butcher was the manager the the injury against against that it wasn't really an injury against Arsenal it was an injury that had been going on for a long time okay so, right and then uh, I mean and I had a an operation that only two players have ever had, and it should never have been done. Wow. One being wow. Trevor Brookin, and the other being me, by the okay. West Ham surgeon at the time, who came up with this uh, operation that he thought would save uh, people's problems in terms of groin strains. And he took a bone out of my hip and put it into my pelvis to wow. fuse my pubic symphysis. Uh, and six months after, I'm worse than I was before the operation. So... I had to go and find my own treatment. Um, I had to rehabilitate at a place where all the top athletes were, were working. I had to pay for it myself as well because the club was sort of saying, well, you can't go elsewhere. And I said, well, if I stay here, you haven't got a qualified physio. The surgeon doesn't know anything about the rehabilitation. Um, I'm never going to play again. So I went and, and, and th that, was the, that was the biggest achievement of my career, uh, without doubt was to play again at Coventry and become Player of the Year at Coventry and their captain. That was, without doubt, that was my biggest achievement. Forget all the other stuff. To come back with all the adversity, with all the problems I had with the injury, and what the injury still causes me now, because you should have movement in your pubic symphysis, and I don't. So right. it caused me all the problems in the back. All the rehabilitation I had to go through, all the fighting I had to go through to get the right treatment away from the, from the club. Um, the club then, like West Ham, sort of almost didn't want me to get fit because it would be uh, yeah, the sign that they hadn't helped yeah, you. Yeah. 
Uh, and so that was that was the biggest achievement by a long way. And again, you talk about um, coincidences. I get the Player of the Year uh, for Coventry on the last home game of the season in front of it was actually thirty, I think twenty eight, twenty nine thousand mm-hmm. people. Who were they playing against? West Ham. West Ham. So I go and collect the uh, trophy on the pitch in front of all yeah. the Coventry supporters and in front of the West Ham fans who we beat one nil and West Ham were relegated. So it was quite a, it was quite a, a nice day for me, and probably a bad day for the West Ham hierarchy and the management at the time. Sort of cool rubbing your nose in it, but not, you know, it's not in a deliberate way because you were the player of the year at Arsenal. Year. You were the player of the year at West Ham once. So there's a theme here, Stuart. There's a theme. Yeah, I mean, in fact, the last three full years I had, I was the player of the year at each club because I only had one full year at West Ham where I played yeah. all the games when I wasn't injured. And, it had, and, it, and, it, and I only had one full year at Coventry before I was injured. So yeah. the last season at Arsenal, the one season at West Ham where I played all the games and the one uh, season at Coventry when I played all the games, I was player of the year at all three. So, wow. it, so when I was fit, I knew I could play. But unfortunately, yeah. I wasn't fit enough in the last few years of my career. Yeah. Um, what might have been... so. A couple of last questions because I've really enjoyed going through all your stages. And as you say, you you arrived as a young, you know, 17-year-old and you made it and then you went through all these various, you know, the three clubs and the injuries, but you're still, as you say, player of the year when you actually play. Can you remember playing in the opening match of the Premier League? Uh, the opening match of the Premier League was for Coventry... Yes. Against Middlesbrough. Correct. And uh, no one knew what the Premier League was going to be at the time. Um, and we go back to, it was, it was a slightly, uh, what's the right word? It's, it was slightly disappointing to a certain degree because I, I was so pleased with my season at Coventry. And we talked earlier about mm-hmm. how you play for managers and how you, how you feel at home. Yeah. Well, I'd had this season at, at Coventry, who won a particularly good side, and mm-hmm. Terry Butcher had taken me there, who I got on really well with, but unfortunately he got sacked. But in his place came Don Howe, who I also got on yeah. very well with. Yeah. And they then, because I played so well, Coventry wanted me to sign a longer contract, which I was willing, which I wanted to do. You know, Aston Villa were, were, were making uh, inroads to try and sign me. Uh, mm-hmm. Tottenham were trying to sign me under Terry Venables. Uh, Leeds were trying to sign me and they've just been the champions. But I wanted okay. to stay at Coventry because I knew of all the, uh, how I didn't want to go to another club and say to them, listen, I was going to play for you, but I have to have my own treatment and I have to do this and I have to do these exercises yeah. beforehand and I can't do yeah. this and I can't do that. So I wanted to stay at Coventry who knew all those things. Right. Or I thought they did. And then they appointed Bobby Gould to be the manager. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and straight away Don Howe resigned and again that caused the problem in my relationship with with Bobby Gould so going into that first game of the season there'd already already been problems I was the captain of the club uh, and my wife was expecting uh, a second child and Bobby Gould said to me and I said to me well you, you stay because I'm still living in London you stay down there I only come in twice a week because you're the fittest player we've done all the tests you're the fittest player in terms of you know uh, bleed test and the speed test and all yeah. this stuff. So you just stay down there for for uh, 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 most of the week and just come up and train with us twice a week and and that'd be fine. Yeah, you, you'll be great. I said, well, thanks very much, but I'm not sure it's the right policy. Oh, no, it'd be great. Uh, then I get a phone call about three days later from Steve Grozovic saying, have you seen the commentary Evening Telegraph? So I said, no. He said, Bobby Gould's taken the captaincy away from you because you only come in twice a week. So, obviously, that doesn't go down too well. So, that was the backdrop to going into that first game against Middlesbrough. Yeah. Um, which I think we won 1-0. 2-1, uh, one, one, actually. 2-1. Yeah. 2-1. Yeah. And, and the post uh, scored. John Williams yeah. scored, I think, one of the goals. The post from John Williams. That I mean, that was his moniker, wasn't it? The yeah, post from John Williams. He was it, on the commentary, the that's what they say. He was the quickest player in the Football League at the time. He'd won the, the, wow. the sprint. Race that they had. Oh, when they used to have it at the League Cup, yeah. finally, yeah. it was a pre. And he won. Wow. And he, oh, he was quick. Uh, 
And he, yeah. he had a great start and he scored in that game. He scored two against Spurs in the second game, which we drew, which we won 2 0, I think. Um, so it was a good start to the Premier League season. Uh, and that game against Middlesbrough, I think Middlesbrough might have gone down that year. They weren't a particularly good team. Yeah, they did. It's a good start for Coventry. Well, funnily enough, I, as I say, I looked at the very quick match of the day highlights. Uh, and you're right that the first goal is scored by, I mean, it's John the Postman Williams, as always mm. called. And I think Stepped I crossed with a, a lovely cross by a guy called Stuart Robson. That's right. I remember it well. That was, the, that was my favourite little run through the inside right position. Uh, yeah. And then whipping it along the six yard box. That was something exactly. that I did on a regular basis at Coventry. It was, a, it yeah. was sort of... early on in the game, nine minutes yeah. bang, and there you go. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, you you ended up winning two one. So there are there are two other things I wanted to talk to you about because um, we've talked about you know your professional cl- playing career and how that's come along. Um, can you remember the first game you actually went to as a spectator? Now, I looked this up because I knew, obviously, we were going to be on the show. Yeah. And I haven't got great memory of it. Um, no. But I, what I do know, it was in 1971-72, I think. Okay. It was Tottenham Hotspur against Nottingham Forest. Okay. And the reason I went to the game was because my uncle and cousins, uh, so my yeah. mum's brother, they'd moved up to Grantham. Uh, oh, Lincolnshire. Yeah. Lincolnshire. And they became Nottingham Forest fans. Yes. And they, they started to follow the team around. And they came down for this Spurs game. And, you know, those are the days where you didn't have to have a ticket. You just went there and paid. And yeah. they said they would take me to the game. Okay. So I went to the game. And bizarrely, I can remember just in, in, in the, in the uh, back of my mind, you were able to walk all the way around the inside of the ground. So when Nottingham Forest were attacking one end, mm-hmm. you, you stood behind that goal. And then at half time, you walked yeah. all the way around and stood behind the other goal. Whether right. the other fans did the same or not, I don't remember. All I remember is that. But unfortunately for my my uncle and my cousins, the game was 6 1 to Tottenham. That's oh. all I did remember. Uh, oh, well, um, you know. You got to start somewhere, and I, I, that wasn't such a great start. But um, so that you know, White Hart Lane, as you say, you could walk around the ground, which again, fans of today, the younger generation, would not understand. understand how that works uh, at all. I think it would be I think you were, you started terracing. at one, and they opened a gate, and you could walk along yeah. the, the the side, and they opened the gate at the other end, and you got into the other end. And that's what what different, fans did in those days. Different world, different world, yeah. Stuart. Um, my my last question really is because obviously you've moved from being a player into the commentary box. Mm. Can you remember the first game that you were uh, a commentator, stroke co commentator, stroke pundit? Is that something that is fresh in your mind? Um, not particularly fresh in my mind because there was all sorts of things I did. So there were reporting, there was radio commentaries, mm-hmm. uh, TV commentary. They they were all mixed together. It was. Um, so I can't, but what I will say is the first World Cup game that I commentated on, yeah, um, with John Champion, um, uh, and we were, I was working for ESPN. I've been doing commentary for a lo- lo- uh, quite a long time, but we went to the World Cup in Brazil, and mm-hmm. uh, it was a great experience. Six weeks away with a little team, we went all around the all around the country, and the first yeah. game we did, um, I think it was in. Um, oh, I can never, never, it wasn't Fortaleza, it was the other one we went to that we, where we stayed. But it was the famous game where the Dutch beat the Spanish. Oh, uh, yeah. And uh, Van Persie didn't scored. Just beat they, they just they absolutely beat 5 moved. 2, I think it was, or 5, yeah, five yeah. 2. Five and one, Van Persie yeah. scored, yeah. Van Persie the scored. Flying header. Flying header. Uh, and it was just that I, I can remember. I don't get nervous when I'm doing commentaries, but I can always remember being really nervous that day because suddenly this was almost like playing again. We were, we were going to be going out into a massive audience um, and you think, am I going to get the words out? When John Champion introduced me, is, mm-hmm. is my mouth going to be dry? Am I going to get the words out? And I just remember that being the most nervous I've ever been um, doing a, a, a co commentary Never been nervous since or before, but that was the game where it just seemed that as though you'd moved to a different level. Uh, and this was yeah. now massively important and you couldn't get anything wrong. Uh, yeah. But it, 
great experience. Well, I'm sure John Champion, knowing him well, would have been a guiding hand. He wouldn't have wound you up at all. Oh, right? not at all. No, no. He, he didn't make you feel more nervous by saying, we've got to get <laughs> right because we're working, for, we're working for a new company. He took me out. He, he probably won't tell you this, but we went no. before we went to the, the, the city where the game was going to be played. We were staying in the um, Rio de Janeiro in the, in the, in the Marriott, right opposite yes. the Coca Cabana. Mm -hmm. And um, he said, should we go for a little walk? And uh, so I said, okay. And I said, he said, we might as well see the Coca Cabana just for, um, uh, you know, one last time. Yeah. Strange, but anyway, yeah, okay. You know, we've been warned <laughs> that you should be walking down there because there's all sorts of problems. And we're yeah. walking along. And I realised that this was his little pep talk to me, you know, because we hadn't yeah. worked together before. He was, this yeah. was his little pep, you know, we need to make sure we get this right. You know, this is a big company we're working for and this could be the start yeah. of the a long career with ESPN, you know, and okay. you need to say this and you need to get that right. So that was his little pep talk and it worked very well because right. we've been well, working for ESPN for a long time since then. So it was, it was, a, it was a good experience. Okay. So he obviously set the ground in the, in the right way, but um, I think that's a pretty good place to end because we've traveled with you. So you were coming to your first ever match on the train from, you know, as you say, from Canby Island, mm -hmm. ended up in Fenchurch Street, being get, getting in a car with Brian McDermott. We'd been through your little contretemps with Graham Roberts and with David Batty, and then we've ended up with you alongside John Champion on Copacabana Beach. And that is a journey that all of us have enjoyed. I've loved having you on, Stuart. It's been a pleasure and... It certainly did start with a kick at certain stages. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Really enjoyed um, it. Thank you very much, Richard.